name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mother of divine grace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. This class I want to devote toward to the virtues. We can't go into detail in each one of them, but I want to give some just a basic outline and kind of put them in the context of what we've been talking about. If you remember in the three stages of the interior life, you have the purgative, and that's when you know, you're purified of your imperfections and you start working on getting rid of vices and that's the thing you stop sinning. And then there's the illuminative, and then there's the unitive. St. Thomas names them slightly differently. He, even though they're, they're, the, the demarcation is the same. Here he calls this the beginners. And he says the beginners just try and stay out of mortal sin and try and stay out of sin, basically, he says. And that's, those are the, that's basically people are going through purgation. They're just trying to stop sinning. And then he says, and the beginners, their, their focus is the world. So they're in the process of trying, by stopping the sin, they're trying to turn towards God. And then he says there's what they call the proficient. And the proficient, he says, are those who take joy in the practice of virtue. So they're building virtue, but they're building it, and their motivation for building it is that they like what virtue does to them. And St. Thomas says virtue does two things to a person. It makes the haver of the virtue good. In other words, it perfects him. It, the various faculties of his soul are perfected. They're rightly ordered. They're directed towards the ends which they're supposed to be. So it makes you actually good. And then he says it inclines towards good action. So the person who is virtuous is the person who's just inclined to do the right thing at the right moment. And that's, that actually makes him good. So the proficient, though, their motivation, though, isn't quite purified yet. And so they're just trying to work on the virtue. They're, they take joy each time they perform an act of virtue. St. Thomas says one of the effects of virtue is, you know, when you're first trying to start out and do the virtuous thing, it's difficult and it's painful. But he says as a person starts gaining a certain habit in that area, that is, he starts gaining the virtue a little bit, he says virtue is its own reward. So there's a certain pleasure that comes in the, in the process of actually doing that, doing the action that fits that virtue. So the person actually begins to take joy in it. And that's where the proficient people are. They're actually the people who take joy in, in the doing it. So they, they're trying to make themselves better because they're trying to be good. But they're not quite perfect because their motivation is still perfecting themselves. Whereas he says, people that are in the unitive way he calls the perfect. And he says the difference between the proficient and the perfect is the perfect also work on perfecting to increasing virtue. But their motivation is God alone. They only do the things for, for the virtue, for the sake of God, and that's it. That, basically, it's the motivation of charity. And that, the perfect, the proficient, the beginners, are very different by the way they employ the different virtues. There are two kinds of virtue. There are what we call acquired virtue, such as the virtue of justice. The person who has the acquired virtue of justice is someone who doesn't steal other people's property. He's somebody who, um, you know, if he owes somebody a certain amount, like if he buys something, he actually pays them what is due to them, that type of thing. So this is somebody who has the acquired virtue of justice or the acquired virtue of temperance. So the person who has the acquired virtue of temperance doesn't eat too much. He moderates his speech, things like that. Then the, the acquired virtue you can build on your own. You can just perform the action that pertains to that virtue. So if you want to, you know, if you want to be truthful, you know, if people who have a problem with lying, well, I want to stop lying. Okay, well, then what do you do? You start doing the opposite, which is telling the truth. And you start doing that. And as you do that action, then you build up truth in your faculties. And then as a result, you'll be uh, that virtue of truthfulness. And then as a result, as you do that repeatedly, then um, it becomes easier to do it. Uh, and that's one of the things that inclines towards, the, towards good action. It makes doing the good life, or to leading a good life, easier. For the longest time, I couldn't quite figure out why St. Thomas says that the, the finality of the moral life is virtue, that is, the vir to developing virtue. 
I couldn't quite figure that out. I mean, I knew that was one of its effects, but I went, why is that the end? Why isn't the end of the mor of moral life to act well, to perform the right action at the right thing? And the reason being is because someone can perform the right action without virtue, and that's not as good as someone who does it with virtue. And this is something which is really different in our culture. It's the product of a guy named Immanuel Kant. Kant had the idea that a, an action was more meritorious if it was difficult, and so if something was difficult for you to do, you actually gained more merit for it. So if you ever watched or ever read the Calvin and Hobbes um, cartoons when they were, or the comics when they were running, there was a point where Calvin was um, saying that he should get more Christmas presents than Susie because it was harder for him to be good than Susie and therefore more meritorious, so he deserved more presents than Susie, even though he was only being good for a month out of the year, and of course then he goes the whole of Advent not being good at all, but then he argues in the end that only one day of being good is better than all the days in which... She, but this is a product of... It's a Protestant ethic, actually, but it's actually what... This is what Kant brought about. Whereas St. Thomas says it's the exact opposite. Let me give you an example. If you see somebody figure skating out on the ice and they don't have much talent or virtue, they don't have, they don't have the habit of doing it very well, you can tell it's hard and difficult for them and it just doesn't go as smoothly and easily and so it doesn't please us as much. It's the same thing in, in a, um, when you do a, uh, when someone plays an instrument, you know, somebody who has um, a lot of, who has developed their talent, that is, they have the habit the habits that go along with playing that instrument, when they play it, it's much better than the person who, they might be able to get through the piece, but they struggle through it and that type of thing, and then so it's, it's not as, as beautiful to us because there's not you know, as much symmetry and proportion in the way they do everything. Okay, so what's this all mean? It's the same thing in the moral life, that it's actually more meritorious the more easily you perform the good action. And that's because of the fact that, now that doesn't mean that the good action can't be some arduous, like something pertaining to fortitude, like undergoing martyrdom. But it's, it's something in which, if it's, as you develop the virtue, it makes it easier, and then when you do it, you actually do it better. You perform that action better, with greater ease, with less reflection, and that type of thing. And so as a result, it's just executed more perfectly, and that's why it's more meritorious. This is why it's our, what Our Lady does is more meritorious than what we do because of the fact that she was perfect in virtue. Okay, but then there's the, okay, so there's the acquired virtues, and those are the virtues you can de develop on your own. And you can also lose them, and the acquired virtues are had by degree. So you, can, you start out with a little bit, and it builds up, and then you have more and more and more of it. Um, and you can also lose it. And acquired virtues are not lost through a single action. So for example, if if someone has been in the habit of telling the truth for a number of months and they haven't told a lie and then they tell a lie once, it's not like all of a sudden they lack that habit. It, the next time that that issue comes up, they'll still have that inclination from that habit, so they still have the habit, but it's diminished. So you can diminish your virtue based if you do an action contrary to the virtue. So if you lie, well, then it'll diminish the virtue of truthfulness. Then there is the infused virtue. And these are of three kinds. The first are the moral infused virtues, and that's what I'm going to spend most of the time on tonight. And then there are the theological. Actually, we'll just leave it with that, the, the infused and the theological. There's also another infused kind of habit. It's called um, the gift of the Holy Ghost, but we're going to talk about that in another class. But the theological and the moral virtues, the theological, of course, are faith, hope, and charity. And those are, ha so they're infused. So if you remember, when you're in the state of grace, and you're trying to advance in holiness, of course, but when you're in the state of grace, God infuses in you all of the infused virtues. All of them. I'm going to give you a list of them. There's quite a list. He infuses all of them in you. But, um, the, all the theological and the moral, but there is a difference is between the infused and the acquired. Both, you can make use of the infused virtue, and I'll, show, I'll tell you how you do that in a little bit. But infused virtues are impeded, even though you have the virtue, like you all, if you're in the state of grace, you have the infused virtue of prudence, and then you do something stupid, right? Well, then you're like, well, where did that come from? If I have the infused virtue of prudence, why am I doing something, you know, that's bad? Well, the reason is, as St. Thomas says, is that 
the infused virtues are impeded in their actions by vice, by acquired vices. So if you have an, an acquired vice in a particular area, for example, you have the infused virtue of temperance. But let's say, suppose you have the acquired vice of every time you see chocolate, Godiva chocolate, you just like lose your marbles and start without reflecting, okay. Well, then you're like, well, why can't I be temperate if I've got the infused virtue of temperance? That's because you've got this vice, this acquired vice that's inclining you contrary to what the infused virtue is. And so St. Thomas says, well, then how do you make the infused virtues perfectly operative? He says, you remove all of your defects. So you remember this whole business of going through the primitive way? As you start removing all your imperfections, then what happens is, is that we begin to be inclined more towards the infused virtues. And, that's, and then, as you also begin to, uh, going up the scale of, of um, going through this process of being purified and then being illumined by God and then having un union with Him, then what happens is also, is, as you're going up to these levels of prayer, you're also increasing your state of grace. Now here's an interesting thing. The, how much infused virtue you have is proportionate to a few things. How much state of grace you have, how much grace you have. The more grace you have, the, the greater the virtues that you will actually, the infused virtues you will actually have. <clears throat> Second, you can pray to have an increase in the infused virtues. So you can, like, you know, if you're really having a difficult time figuring out what the prudent thing is, just ask God, God, give me, you know, help me to be more prudent. You know, help me to be, um, help me to operate, act according to infused prudence. And I'll t we'll talk about another thing that distinguishes these. Obviously, they're the different cause. God causes the infused. You can't cause them at all. At all. All you can do is pray or do certain things to merit an increase in grace, or maintain your state of grace, and then they will be there. But it's not the type of thing that if I perform an act of, that would pertain to infused prudence, that somehow or another I increase it, like I do acquire. Rather, what St. Thomas says is, by doing that, you dispose the faculty towards a higher reception of it, and then God infuses more of it. See, we're not the cause. The infused virtues are caused by God. The acquired virtues are. But again, the way you make the infused virtues operative is you start acquiring you start acquiring the acquired virtues, that is getting rid of your vices, and then the infused virtues can also become operative. But it's here, it's at these stages that the infused virtues are becoming more perfectly operative. They all are also operative down in this level too. For example, someone might go to confession and confess some sin of gluttony, and then um, they'll come out of the confessional and someone shows them the chocolate, right? And they, you know, then they'll have, they might have initial inclination from this infused virtue, but then they'll come up against this, this vice. Now, if they choose to go follow the infused virtue, then they do that, but that means that you can still make use of it even in, in this stage. So all of you can still make use of it, unless you're up in these, then you're always using it. But um, the point is that those who reach the stage, the unitive stage, are always, in every action, always acting according to infused virtue. And that's what the perfection ultimately consists in. So, um, as you ascend to the heights of prayer, it's because it's, again, stop sinning, building virtue, that is, acquired virtue. Then you also have to start acting according to the infused virtues. And this is one of the biggest differences. The acquired virtue, each virtue has an action, and an action always acts upon some object. So, for example, eating, that's the action, chocolate, all right, that's the object, that's the thing about which the action is concerning itself. In, in moral theology, whenever I teach this, I always tell the seminarians, <clears throat> as to give an example of how you can have different kinds of objects, I said, you know, there's a difference between throwing a washing machine off of a building and throwing a midget off of a building. You know, the image, image of a midget always sticks in people's minds. You, know? you have to use colorful things because that way it creates the right images and then people can remember them. Okay. But the object here, okay, so in this particular case it's the object. In acquired virtue, the objects are always something created, such as your wife in relationship to things pertaining to the Sixth Commandment or other women if you're not married or even if you are married. It's food 
Um, it also can be things that are arduous, you know, like work and things of that sort. But it always deals with something that's created, and that's its object. And so, if people have a hard time in relation, and this is something that's really interesting, St. Thomas says that virtue determines how you relate to the object. If you have virtue, you'll relate to the object well. You can look at the chocolate, and you can either take it or not take it. Whereas if you're vicious, that is, if you don't have virtue when you're around it, you're less, you have less free will because it's harder for you to stay away from it. Whereas if you're virtuous, you can either take it or leave it. And so it help, the virtue helps your faculty to relate well to the thing. Okay. But it's always in relationship to something created, the acquired ones are. Whereas the infused virtues always have God as their object. So how do you have God as your object when you have something like infused temperance? Well, it's quite easy. It's your motivation. It is, that is, what is your, what is your intention? Or, as we say in moral theology, the finality. So, for example, there is a difference between the acquired virtue of dieting, which is part of the virtue of temperance, because in that particular case, a person who developed virtue purely for the sake of health. That's a good thing, actually. But it's not perfect. Whereas if a person fasts, so you can have a natural virtue of fasting, which is we call dieting, but you can have a natural virtue of fasting for the sake of health, that's good. But you can also do the sake of fasting for God. And that is done by means of the virtue, infused virtue of religion and charity. In other words, you offer it up to God. In other words, you, you fast for the sake of God. You offer it up for God as a sacrifice or an offering. Or you, um, you know, if your wife is driving you nuts, or if someone around you is driving you nuts, then what do you do? Instead of getting angry, you offer it up or you say some prayer for them, for, the love, you know, for God's sake. So what this does is, is through the motivation of charity, charity has as its proper object love of God. And so that's its action, loving God. And so you're inclined towards loving God, and that's why you do it in this particular moment, which is why St. Francis de Sales made such a big thing, which is a wonderful thing, about, you know, everything has to be done for the love of God. Um, but anyway, the point is, because that's, that's something that's very important, so your intention has to be from the point of view of charity, doing this for the love of God. And you love your neighbor for the sake of God not for his own sake. Because if you just love him for his own sake, that's an acquired virtue. And that's why Christ says the Gentiles do as much. Why? Because they're capable of acquiring virtues. So the issue is, is the infused virtues, though, you do it for the motivation of God, but it's also part of the virtue of religion. Because you're offering it to God or you're doing it for the motivations of God, it fulfills part of the infused virtue of religion. And so... The saints, the difference between the proficient and the perfect is that the proficient vacillate between doing it for God and doing it for creative motives. That is, doing it for earthly motives. Whereas the perfect always do it from charity. They're always doing it for the love of God. Okay. So that gives you an idea of how these actual virtues are. Now the virtue, how they, just kind of a basic outline. Now the virtues perfect... They're a quality. You know, we know that. There's something qualitatively different about somebody who has a lot of virtue and somebody who doesn't. And we react <coughs> differently. And there are four faculties. I don't have to go to all the faculties um, of, of man. It would be too long, of course. But there's four faculties of man that we need to t take a look at. And these virtues, or these faculties will give you an idea of exactly how the, vir the virtues function. The virtues perfect one of our faculties. Now, a faculty is an ability of us to perform some function. So, for example, the faculty of sight gives us the ability to see. That's an action. Um, the intellect gives us the ability to know the truth. The proper object of the intellect is truth. The proper object of the will is the good. So it helps us to will, to be inclined, to choose the good. The irascible appetite... That's the one that pertains to anger. These deal with what we call passions or emotions, and that's why they're called appetites. So the, um, this deals with things such as anger, hope. By hope, we don't mean the theological virtue of hope, but hope in just the sense of, even animals have these two. Like, for example, you know, you, 
you tell, you, you, all you have to do, for instance, to my sister's dog is say the word treat. And all of a sudden, they're jumping around. And then they, they run over where they know the treats are and they're, they're waiting. Well, that's because they have hope. Because there's something coming, you know. I'm waiting for this, you know. So that's, that's part of the irascible appetite. But the irascible appetite moves us or inclines us towards dealing with things that are arduous and difficult. So if we didn't have an irascible appetite, uh, football would be extremely boring. Because you have to use the appetite to, in, to motivate the body to actually do it. So like the problem is, is that these things went awry. So if you remember from your Baltimore Catechism, there are three effects of original sin. Darkening of the mind, so the intellect has a harder time grasping the truth. Do you remember what the other two are? Weakening, Weakening of the will, and then, yeah, inclination to evil. And that's what that principally pertains to here. So what virtue does is it counteracts the effects of original sin. It perfects these specific virtues, or these specific particular faculties. Now the concupiscible faculty is the one that deals with bodily goods, food, and things pertaining to the sixth commandment, that is conjugal relations. So that's what it principally... Now you can gain an emotional desire because we have reason. We can train our appetites to desire, that is, the concupiscible appetite to actually desire things that aren't proper to our body as such. For, in, for example, a car or a computer. You know, a computer, strictly speaking, doesn't fulfill any bodily need of the individual. So, but it can fulfill other needs of the individual, like intellectual, the thing can fulfill it. And so the, the mind can train the appetites to desire these things. And that's really what, when you're great raising children, the goal is to train, make the, give the child the proper associations, as Aristotle says, by pleasure and pain by punishing him when he does the bad things and then rewarding him when he does the good things. Excess in both sides will end up with a child that's not rightly ordered. So if you're always giving him the rewards, you know, you know, yes, Johnny, two plus two does equal five. Here's your star. Well, sorry, the kid's just going to end up not getting reality right. And it's the same thing, too, though. If you're always negative and you're always punishing the kid, it's always the kid, as says the scripture, um, um, Fathers, don't nag your children, at least they lose heart. So what happens is the children, you know, there's no positive motivation. Anyway, the point being in all of this is, is that the virtues actually perfect these faculties and bring them under control as far as the concupiscible and the irascible appetite. So, for example, anger, the opposite, the virtue that is opposite of the vice of anger. Now, anger is a passion, but it can also be a vice in the sense of if it's by excess, you're always getting angry very easily and too much. Whereas a person who's meek, the irascible appetite doesn't move, okay? Until these appetites, before the fall, these appetites never moved until reason said this is worth desiring or this is worth becoming angry over. Which meant that Adam and Eve never had what we call antecedent appetite. That is, appetite that is contrary to our will or that occurs before we have a chance to really gain control over it. So, for, and most people, this is what they spend all their time. The purgative way, what you're doing is you're trying to get rid of all your antecedent appetite. How do you get rid of antecedent appetite? Virtue. Because as you perfect these faculties through virtue, they become more subordinated to reason, and then your appetites won't move until reason says yay or nay. Okay, to it. So, but the point is, is that antecedent occurs before intellection, that is, before you actually think of the thing. And this is, this is true, you know, somebody will come in and just, they press your buttons, and before you even have a chance to reflect on what's going on, you're like, you're all angry, right? Well, that's antecedent appetite. But the way you get rid of it, the goal, in the illuminative way, the person reaches a stage. Now, you can't root these antecedent appetites out entirely by acquired virtue. God has to drag you through the purgative, the pa passive purgative to root these out entirely. But people will find as they start developing virtue and they start um, doing everything they can to root out their vices that all of a sudden they just notice they're not as emotional as they used to be, there's just not as, they don't get as angry or they don't get, <clears throat> you know, as desirous or not lusting or things like that. Um, so, but the principal way that you get advantage to see an appetite is by developing virtue, but the people who reach the illuminative way or the unitive way, get to a stage where there is no antecedent appetite because of the fact that it's perfectly subordinate. By the time they've reached a state of perfection and the transforming union, it becomes 
perfectly subordinated, the papatites become perfectly subordinated to reason. So, and Our Lady never had any antecedent appetite, and neither did Our Lord. Our Lady's was kept in check by grace, and Our Lord's by grace and also by virtue of the, the fact that he had the beatific vision at the time of his conception. So that's what caused them to be perfectly subordinated. Okay. Then there is what we call consequent appetite. Now, consequent appetite is, very emotional, emotions, is when, you know, someone walks up to you and says, nice cassock, Father. And you're like, oh, well, thank you. And then you look at realize, like, mm, hey, wait a minute. He was saying something mad about me and my cassock. And then they get angry, right? Well, that's because it, it's consequent to the judgment of reason or to the intellect or to, to what you will. And people can choose to become emotional, ultimately. And, as, and what you choose, how you train the antecedent appetite is by determining what you do with your consequent appetite, by trying to mitigate it or get the image out of your imagination. Because the appetites are moved by what floats through your imagination, so you just gotta get it out of your imagination. And then over the course of time, the appetites learn, okay, I don't move, you know, I don't have these antecedent inclinations until reason says yea or nay, right? So virtue, what, what happens is, is through what, doing the right thing at the right time, be commanding the right, consequent ver the consequent appetites, emotional life, it becomes, you know, you know I'm not going to get angry, or I'm only going to eat so much of this. I'm not only going to let myself, you know, want this much type of thing. Um, then what happens is, is the, these emotions, these faculties begin adjusting themselves to what reason says. The reason most people's emotional life is completely out of control is because they've had some antecedent appetite, there's some emotion, and then reason gives into it and confirms it, and then they say, oh, okay, that's how I'm supposed to act. In fact, the punishment fits the crime. When Adam and Eve fell, they had no antecedent appetite. But when they ate the apple, if you remember, Eve looked at the apple and she says it was pleasing to the sight, which meant there was, a, there, was an, there was an appetite, but it was only consequent because she had to think about it. And, but what happened was is reason knew that if you eat this apple, you're acting contrary to reason. So as soon as she ate the apple, what happened? The passions were taught, act contrary to reason. And then that was the punishment for the crime. That meant that she introduced into herself and then Adam ate it. And he introduced into himself the same disorder. So this is something now that we're all dealing with. And the way we deal with it is by developing virtue. See, Adam and Eve before the fall had no virtue because they didn't have to because they had the preternatural gifts, which always kept their appetites and everything in perfect check. But after the fall now, in order to recoup this state in which they were where there was no antecedent appetite, we have to develop virtue. Okay. So in the intellect, with respect to the moral virtues, you have prudence, both infused as well as acquired. In the will, you have justice, and we'll see what these are in a little bit. And then in the irascible appetite, you have fortitude, and in the concupiscible appetite, you have temperance. And then these are subdivided into a variety of different virtues, which I'm going to give you here in a minute. But this is an important thing to keep in mind. These are the faculties you just want to keep in mind because the faith is in the intellect, hope and charity are in the will, and then the gifts of the Holy Ghost are like such as the gift of counsel are in the intellect. Um, the gift of fear of the Lord is in the will. They're, all, they're here, but they have, a, they have an effect down here, which we'll see in a later class. Um, but there's also intellectual virtues, too. But this will give you an idea. So what these do is we acquire these virtues, then it tends to perfect us. Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to just go a little bit through these. These are all the virtues and vices. This will give you an idea of what you're up against. This is what you have to acquire and what you have to avoid. Okay. For the integral part of prudence. Now, prudence is the virtue by which you know the means to attain the end. What does that mean? It's the virtue that helps me to know to do the right thing at the right time in the right circumstances. Okay. And how, in order to have, now there's, oh, there are three different aspects, three different kinds of virtue too. Virtues are broken down into what we call the integral, 
Now, integral, integral virtues are those which, if you don't have this, you don't have any of the other aspects of the virtue. So, for example, if I don't have any caution, I'm not going to have any prudence. If I don't have any memory, I'm not going to have any prudence. If I don't have any shrewdness, which we'll see what these are, I don't have any prudence. Okay, so integrals are those which you have to have if you're going to have the virtue at all. Then there's what we call the potential parts. Actually, I'll do the subjective parts. The subjective parts are parts of the virtue. There's subdivisions within the virtue. So, for example, the, um, the subjective parts, uh, a subjective part of temperance would be the virtue of fasting. That would be an example of it. Okay. Because you, in a subjective part, you can have one part of the virtue without another. A person can have the virtue of fasting but not have custody of the eyes or chastity under control. So that's one of the, that's one of the signs. Whereas the integral parts, you either have it, you have this virtue in order to have the other one or you don't have it at all. Whereas the subjective parts, you can have parts without the other ones. The potential parts are those which are, don't really fall under the virtue, but they relate to it. So, for example, the virtue of religion is usually put, it's a potential part of the virtue of justice. Why? Because the virtue of religion, the will, deals with, it's, it's principally ordered towards the good, right? And it's ordered towards justice. Well, justice is between equals. Well, the problem is we're not an equal to God. And so, strictly speaking, there cannot be justice between us and God because of the fact that we're just not equals. But we'll see how that kind of works itself out a little bit later. Um, so it's, but it's related to justice in the sense of justice is the virtue in which you render to somebody what's due to them, um, neither more nor less. There's a certain equality between the person and the thing that's due to them. And whereas with, with God, it does, we have to do render to God his due. The problem is, is that what we render to him is never proportionate to what he is. It's always below that. Okay. All right. So memory is the virtue. I'll just quickly run through a few of these. Um, memory is the capacity to remember the right things. You know, there's certain people, there's certain people that just, they get burned and burned and burned and burned because they keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Even though they've been burned, they go through the bad experience and yet they go back to it. And that's one of the signs. They're not in the habit of remembering the right things to keep them from doing the, the wrong things or to do the right things. Understanding is just the ability to grasp the, the real reality for what it is, what I'm dealing with, prudentially. That is the action that I'm going to be dealing with. Docility is the ability to be read. read. Shrewdness. St. Thomas says the, the ability to quickly kind of grasp what the thing is to do. You know, there's some people like, what do I do? You know, like, put gas in the car. Uh, well, he's not very shrewd, right? Okay. Then there's uh, reason. That's the ability to, um, to just think, basically. I don't want to go into too much detail. Foresight is the ability to see based on past experience, you know. Um, there's this uh, in The Simpsons. I don't recommend people watch The Simpsons. But one time, Lisa decided to do an experiment to see whether Bart was smarter than the rat. And so she put this thing out there where if the rat touched this bar to grab this thing, this tree, it would get shocked. So it gets shocked once and then the rat it stays away from it, right? Well, Bart just keeps touching it. Ow, 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 ow. Okay, right. Well, that's because he doesn't have any foresight. When he looks at this thing, the bad experience he's had in the past, he looks at it and he doesn't realize, okay, look, that I've had a bad experience with this in the past. It probably means that same kind of thing is going to happen in the future. And that's what foresight is. Um, circumspection. That's the, where you keep track of your surroundings. Now, uh, these destroy people's circumspection instantaneously. I mean, instantaneously. The minute somebody gets mad, they lose all track of the fact that, you know, they're hacking at a priest, for example. Or, you know, uh, you know maybe watch what you're doing, that type of thing. Um, also, people get some type of thing they want, so you'll see this. The, you know, I've got to have that trinket. And so they just like, mm. meanwhile, their kid is off and, you know, running through the traffic while they're looking at this trinket. Hello, your kid's running through traffic. So in other words, the point is, is people lose track of their surroundings. So circumspection is the virtue which helps the person to keep track of their surroundings. 
caution, you know, you know, there's certain things that are just dangerous. So, for instance, the kid who drives 60 miles an hour when it's solid ice out, you know, doesn't have much caution. Then there is the potential parts, good counsel. Good counsel is a person who's just able to figure out what's, you know, to take time to sort things out. Some people have the capacity to do that, some people just don't. And you can develop that ability to do it, to do it well, um, by slowing down, taking time, and that type of thing. Senesis, don't say gesundheit after you say that word. Senesis is the virtue which helps the person know when the common laws apply. So, for example, if a guy steals $50, well, the common law is he has to pay back $50 and he has to do some type of restitution, etc. And so that's the one that just helps, you know, this, this is the Sixth Commandment. This is a case that falls under the Sixth Commandment, so I don't do the Sixth Commandment. That's what, that would be an example of Sinesa. So people who have the ha- that good habit of knowing don't do this, and that's what parents are training their kids. Don't do this. This is against this commandment, or God doesn't want you doing this. And that's what they're training the kids so the kid knows when to apply the law. Nome is a little bit different. Nome is the virtue in which a person, when the common laws don't apply. And, for example, people will come to me and they say that the law is you have to go to Mass on Sunday. So people will say, Father, you know, we're traveling to Tibet. And uh, there's not a traditional Mass there. Do I have to go to Mass? You know, you'll get something like that. And you have to be able to tell if this is how the law is to be applied in this particular case, because a lot of times people are quickly, nome is not very, not very abundant today. And you have to, in order to have nome, it is to know to apply, St. Thomas says, to apply higher principles, the things that are, you know, like the natural law or the divine positive law, what was God's intention, promulgating this law type of thing. In order to know those subtleties, you have to be a very virtuous individual. Most people aren't very virtuous, and so they're very quick to excuse themselves from going to Mass or doing this or doing that. And so that's one of the things that's... Um, that virtue is uh, very hard to develop, and there's very few people that have it. Vice is contrary to prudence. Precipitation. Precipitation is when a person doesn't take counsel. You know, you, know, you should have fought before you did that. It's usually when people say that. Say that. Um, in consideration is, yeah, you thought about it, but you didn't consider which is the best way to go about this. All right. In constancy, okay, you figured out the right thing to do, and you said, okay, I'm going to do it, and then you get into the situation, okay, I'm going to tell Bessie Sue we have to stay away from each other because we can't, we, we keep violating the Sixth Commandment together. So you get around Bessie Sue, right? And then the next thing happens is, is what? The appetites affect his judgment, and the next thing he's like, and so he's inconstant. So instead of telling her, no, we've got to stay away from each other, he's like, oh, okay, we'll stay, you know. So it's, that's inconstancy where you vacillate back and forth. Negligence, that's when a person doesn't take too due care to consider the means or to do what is necessary or to, or to even do the things that you're supposed to do. Um, I don't want to get too much into all of these. Some of these are kind of obvious, guile, fraud. Craftiness is um, when a person... Um, uses deceit in order to obtain something, which is a little bit different from guile. Guile is normally in words, fraud is normally in deeds. Um, That is, you do something illegal. Justice, okay, justice is the virtue by which you render someone their their due. So there's commutative justice, that's between equals, between individuals. So if I say, you know, okay, go clear the driveway and I'll pay you $50, and then you go clear the driveway, then commutative justice demands I give you $50. So it's between um, individuals and equals. Then there's legal justice. That's what I have to render to the common good of society. So, for example, part of legal justice is paying your taxes. Uh, although the problem with Caesar is, you know, Christ said to, say to pray to Caesar's with Caesar. So he's, Christ is affirming the order of legal justice. The problem with Caesar today is he wants what's not Caesar's. And that's the problem with Caesar today. Then there's the distributive, because ju- quite frankly, I don't think Caesar should be entitled more than God is, and God only wanted a tenth part, so why does Caesar think he should get 90% of your money? All right. Then there's distributive justice. That's from those who have care of the common good to those who are underneath them. So, for example, the state has an obligation to make sure that certain people are paid or that they are um, taken care of, that just laws are enacted to take care of people that protect the common good. Restitution is part of commutative justice where you pay back 
to somebody, something that you, some damage you've caused or something you've stolen or something of this sort. Um, I think it's St. Alphonsus Liguri says that if a person doesn't make restitution in their life, they can't get into heaven. And that either means if it's a grave thing pertaining to restitution, then it's morally sinful and you don't get into heaven, period. If it's venially sinful, you have to pay it in purgatory. Um, part of that restitution also deals with God's glory. Every time you sin, you steal from his glory, and then as a result, you have to make restitution, and we call that what? Reparation. Reparation. Okay, then there's the virtue of religion. That's by which you render to God is due. There's the virtue of prayer. Now, actually, the virtue of prayer is a number of different virtues, but I just put it in one. And it's, but I do this is to tell people that get, ver, prayer is a habit. And you, it's, the reason it's difficult at the beginning is people aren't in the habit of praying. Well, if you're not in the habit of doing something, it's difficult. Whereas if you keep doing it, and, it, and for, because... Because our faculties, this darkening of the intellect, there's a rather complicated thing. If you want to know what the cause is, you can read my books on psychology. But there's, our faculties are rather disordered, and it takes a long time and a lot of habituation to get the various ones under control in order for us not to get distracted and so that the habit of prayer becomes easy. These, the, if you get your habit, the more you develop virtue, the easier the prayer becomes. Okay. Now, one of the virtues is mortification which falls under uh, um, temperance. Now, most people uh, don't bother with it. And then they wonder why they're distracted. Why? Well, mortification gets these appetites under control. So, for example, if a person never fasts, then when somebody's baking cookies and they're trying to pray, guess what the body's saying? Guess what the appetite's saying? Cookies, cookies. That's all that keeps coming into your mind, right? Or if you're attached to something, if you're distracted during, during your prayer, sometimes if you just step back and say, okay, why is that particular thing distracting me? You know, why is the laundry list distracting me? Why is the grocery list distracting me? You know, why, it, it, it's because you have some attachment to it. It's because you're not mortifying it. So do some mortification to break that attachment, and then you'll find that the distractions will clear up. All right. Um, so prayer, adoration, that's where you, um, you basically adore God. Uh, sacrifice. The virtue of sacrifice is by which you give something good back to God in some type of manner of offering. Now, here's the kicker. This religion, prayer, adoration, and sacrifice are acquired virtues, but they're also infused virtues. Now, here's the problem. Because God reveals to us the teachings that pertain to him and the manner in which we must live our religion, this is why when people say, oh, you know, people worship God in different ways. Uh-uh. Sorry, that's not how it works. God reveals to us the way in which he wants to be worshipped, and then we have to do, and then we have to do that. He does that through revelation. And then we do that, when we engage in that manner, then we can use the infused virtue. But somebody who doesn't have revelation neither fulfills or develops a proper virtue or religion, nor, neither infused nor inquired. Why? acquired. Why? Because of the fact that religion is rendering due, due worship to God. He tells us this is the worship that is due to me. If you don't know that, you'll do something contrary to that, so you violate justice, and so you're not developing the virtue of religion. So what's the moral of the story? You cannot develop the acquired, even the acquired virtue of religion, in which you are doing the acts of religion for um, created motivations, for example, to, because you want to become more perfect, or um, you know, that type of thing. Not that you're not, because you can, that can be legitimate, in the lower stages, but as you start advancing, then the religion has to be done purely for the love of God. But you cannot develop even the acquired virtue of religion without revelation. This is one of the reasons why it's so difficult for people outside of Catholicism to develop all of the virtues. All right. Adjuration, that's when you do commanding, things like demons and that sort. Piety, piety is the virtue in which one gives honor to one's parents or to one's fatherland. So, patriot, which is basically to your forefathers. And so, patriotism is a sub-virtue to piety. Piety is the virtue in which 
the person has a disposition or the habit of giving honor. Dulia, which is do honor to one's superiors. Now, sometimes people will see that in relationship to the saints, and that's and to Our Lady, hyperdulia to Our Lady. Obedience, which is something that's virtually never developed today. Obedience is a promptness of will to do, to serve, or to do the will of our superior. You don't see too many people doing that. Gratitude or thankfulness. Virtually people don't develop that at all. So when you see people pile out of Mass immediately after Mass, week after week, mask after Mass, you know they're not developing that virtue. Although don't judge them because they could have legitimate reasons. Just vindication. That is um, when a per- the person is in the habit of seeking that the harm that people are causing is put an end to. And sometimes that means that you actually have to harm other people. So the idea of, now by harm we mean physically harm, not spiritually or morally harm, but we're talking about just, you know, sometimes, for example, if some guy's walking through, you know, a bus station or through a McDonald's mowing people down with an AK-47, you don't sit there and say, well, we just, it's not virtuous not to, not to do anything to stop the guy because we'd have to harm him to do that. It's just nonsense. There are times in which it's necessary to seek vindication to put an end to the harm for the sake of the common good, for example. Truthfulness, in English that's called honesty, just always telling the truth. Friendship or affability, there's certain people that actually can develop. You can develop the habit of being able to be easily befriended. Liberality, that's when you use your own money, not other people's money, to relieve the needs of the poor and things of that sort. So that's part of that virtue. In theology, sometimes they call that almsgiving. So, but liberality is when you help other people. So, a true liberal is actually somebody who uses their own money, not somebody who taxes everybody and then uses that money. All right. Epikaia, that's the virtue in which when the common law doesn't apply, the person knows what the mind, or also when the common law does apply, what the mind of the legislator is. So, for example, St. Thomas gives the example of the mind of the legislator, he says, after 9 o'clock at night, the doors to the, to the city are to be closed because we've had these marauders come in, and so the doors are to be closed. Well, if they get in at 8.30, you don't close the doors and say, oh, well, no, the law is you can't open the doors. No, well, Epikaia tells you what the mind of the legislator is. The mind is get the marauders out or keep them out, so you open the doors up so you can get them out. All right. Too many people evoke Epikaia to get out from underneath everything, but anyway. The vices against justice, uh, justice, human respect, murder, mutilation, theft, robbery. The difference between theft and robbery is, is that theft is the occult. It is the quiet or the private taking of something, whereas robbery is when it's done to the person in their face using the violence. Judging people, false accusation, perjury, contumely. Contumely is when you denounce somebody or say something bad about somebody, usually false, to somebody, um, to their face or in the presence of other people. Detraction is when you say something true, but it's usually done quietly and it's, um, it has a different name. Murmuring, I love the Latin word for this, it's surseratio. But what murmuring is, is murmuring is, is when you go and you say something negative about somebody to someone else in order to separate the person's affections from them. So, for example, suppose there's, you know, somebody you really don't like and you notice this guy kind of likes him and you go and you badmouth him so that this person will stop liking him. That's called murmuring. Okay. Derision is when you do, you do something and laugh at people. Malediction is when you curse. That's cursing. Malediction is when you actually condemn something that is different from the, the cursing, which we use people often, which is swearing, which is against the virtue of modesty. Fraud, usury, by usury, now the moralists usually say that means the excessive taking of excessive interest. Illicit adjuration, superstition, idolatry, divination, and witchcraft, tempting God. People like this one guy, he used to, he had this technique, actually I found out later that it is in fact a technique that was developed by the martial arts where you can jump off high places and land without hurting yourself. Well, this guy had developed that technique to a high degree, so he jumped off the Space Needle in Seattle without any parachutes or anything, and he lands. And he, he stopped after that, he said, because he kind of got some bruises from it, so he figured he better stop. I think that's tempting God. All right. Sacrilege. Um, simony, that's when you buy something that's sacred. Disobedience. Vengefulness, that's when you seek to harm people without 
proportion or without being moderated. Lying. Simulation, sometimes called hypocrisy. Lying is when you say something false, false in order to deceive somebody. Whereas simulation is doing something false in order to deceive somebody. So, for example, somebody comes to you and they, they say, you know, they, um, you, see, you, see the, the, you see some guy come out of the bank, he's got the bags of money, he jumps in the car, and oh, he goes that direction, right? And the cop comes up to you and he says, which direction did they go? And you point the opposite direction. That's simulation. Um, so people often simulate they'll act happy when they're torqued off or something like that. Boat, not that you should go around making people feel the brunt of your being angry. Boasting, ingratitude, irony is when a person it's uh, irony is when, per, when a person says something false about themselves to lo- so that they don't have to deal with certain things so it looks like they're lowering themselves. Adulation, which is flattering, litigiousness. Not that um, suing somebody can't necessarily proceed from justice, of course, but here it's when people are always suing everybody for everything. So you see this going on, I mean, just to try and keep up with the lawsuits that are going on between computer manufacturers is itself a full-time job. Avarice, prodigality or wastefulness. Okay, fortitude. Now, fortitude is the virtue in which it helps one to engage the arduous good. So things that are difficult, you ask for fortitude so that you have the capacity to do it. Okay. Now, some of the virtues that are connected to fortitude, magnanimity, that's greatness of soul. Now, what that is, is it's the person who always strives for the great greatness. And what does greatness of soul consist in? Virtue. So the magnanimous man is the person who always, who's always, he's striving for the virtue because it's difficult to always be virtuous. Magnificence, that's when a person does great things with their money. Again, not with other people's money, but with their own money. So, for example, someone who has spent a lot of money to build, like the, the convent in Agnew, they went to a benefactor who says, build it and I'll pay for it. That was an act of magnificence because they produced something quite magnificent. All right, patience is different from longanimity. Patience is the ability to suffer something, some evil, for a long time. It's not the, the waiting for something. So, for example, people say, you know, the stoplight, I want to get through the light, I want to get through the light, so I lost my patience. Well, okay, the priest knows what you mean, but technically speaking, you, were, you, you lost your longanimity. Long now, that just means longness of soul. Longness of soul is the ability to wait for the good for a long period of time. Kids, of course, don't have it. Okay, whereas patience is dealing with evils, longanimity deals with the things that are good. Perseverance is that when things get difficult, the person continues going and can continue to maintain. Vice is contrary to it. Fear, not, not all fear, but just excessive fear, always being afraid. Fearlessness, audacity, uh, presumption. Presumption is that a person thinks that they're capable of doing something when they can't. Ambition. Now here we're not talking about the English sense of, because usually when people say oh, he's ambitious, it usually means he has a lot of drive and motivation. That's a good thing. Here they're talking about ambition as it proceeds from pride, where the person overestimates what they're capable of, and so they try and attain things that's above and beyond their state in life or beyond their capacities. This is one, ambition is rampant in our culture. And I'll tell you where it's most, most obvious is in college. People come to college, quite frankly, they got the IQ of, I mean, you're lucky if it's double digit, and they want to complete a doctoral program. My cousin made the observation, he said when he got his doctorate, I said, well, congratulations, this doesn't mean anything. Because anybody who goes through advanced studies knows that there's, there's a lot of people studying that don't belong there, right? You know, they're, just, they're not that bright. So what happens is people go through this, and they, they should, in the past, 100 years ago, they might, I mean, most of the people might have finished high school. And then if they went through high school, the very best and brightest probably went to college. And then out of that, maybe out of one of 100 or two, one or two out of 100 might have got their master's. And out of those, maybe one out of 15 or 20 might have gotten their doctorate. Where today is, you get your doctorate because, as my cousin says, I just stuck around long enough for them to give me the degree. Now, he's very intelligent, actually. He's one of these guys that does all these designer drugs and everything. There's so much ambition in college, and people, they shouldn't, and a lot of people shouldn't be in college because they're just not smart enough to be in college. And what's happened is, in order to accommodate all these people coming in who aren't smart enough, 
the grades, are the, there's been great inflation. The standards have been lower, which is a problem. Inane glory, which is vanity, um, which is that a person likes how they're being manifested, you know, and they like how they look and that type of thing. Pusillanimity, which is smallness of soul. That is somebody who's not willing to do something difficult in order to obtain the good. Parveficience, or stinginess, that's contrary to magnificence. That's the guy who does, he wants to, he doesn't want to do anything because he doesn't want to spend any money. So we used to have guys who would come into my dad's shop, you know, and they'd keep buying used tires. He'd be in every week getting another new set of used tires. And you're just like, well, just spend the money and get the tires new and you won't be in here every week, you know. So that's a case of stinginess. Molitius or softness is effeminacy. Molitius in Latin is a term that means softness. It's, it's, it's people who prefer things that always give pleasure. It's the, it's, effeminacy is when a person is unwilling to set aside the pleasure of just being where they're at or the complicity where they're at in order to pursue what is arduous. And we're getting a lot of guys who are very effeminate. Molit says is also one of the Latin terms, terms for masturbation because it's, a, it's somebody who gives into kind of a softness. Pertinacity is a person, it's a vice in which a person holds on to something contrary to reason, a position or a theory that they hold to. Okay, temperance is the virtue which moderates, St. Thomas says, it moderates those pleasures that pertain to touch. And that deals with the Sixth Commandment, but it also deals with things like food, because the food is something that has to touch us in order for us to eat it and to really taste it. So he says it deals with moderation in the pleasures of touch. Shame is the virtue in which the person fears being perceived as lowly, so they stay away, so the person has temperance, stays away from things that are lowly. So they'll stay away from violations of the Sixth Commandment and things like that. Or if they do it, they have, they, if they have the virtue, they'll recognize the lowliness of that, and so there's a certain sense of shame. Honestia, this isn't honesty. It's a, one of those false friends, as they say in linguistics. This is the habit of always seeking to do what is virtuous in each situation. So in other words, it's the habit of always, anytime something arises, the person is in the habit of, okay, what do I do to do the virtuous thing? Not too many people have that. Most people just kind of react. Abstinence, fasting, sobriety, chastity. Chastity is in the concupiscible appetite. It governs it so the person doesn't have any emotions contrary to, um, cha uh, to uh, virtue in this regard to purity. Um, virginity is also a virtue, but the difference is, is that virginity is principally, it's not principally something physical, St. Thomas says, even though that's not a material part of it. It's principally the formal side. That is, if the person has never willed the pleasures that pertain to the Sixth and Ninth Commandments. So it's possible, for example, for a woman to be raped and still have the virtue of virginity, even though she might not have her physical virginity. And that's an important thing for people to remember. Um, so, they, there's, so there's that continence. That's principally in the will, even though it's listed under temperance, which is in the concupiscible of appetite. Continence is the virtue in which you refrain your appetite, or you, you still do what's right, even though your appetites are all over the place. So the continent man is someone who, you know, he might get around Bessie Sue, but he still, you know, does the right thing, even though his appetites are, out of, um, you know, kind of going at it there. Clemency uh, or meekness, sometimes it's also called um, mercy. Um, the meekness is the virtue opposite of anger. Modesty proper, that's the one in which you develop the, um, where your dress doesn't draw people against the Sixth and Ninth Commandments. Humility, contrary to pride, trupalia, the virtue of right recreation, decorum, I've talked about all these, silence, studiosity, that's the virtue in which you apply yourself to those things that pertain to your state in life so that you learn them. Virtue of simplicity, that's one we don't have today. The materialistic consumerism, consumerism is the vice contrary to simplicity. Consumerism is the vice in which you see people see something they buy it because they have the money or they get stuff. They, you know, so you go to people's house and the garage is up to here in junk that they don't even need. And then you go and you find out, man, you got a lot of stuff in your garage. And they'll say, yeah, you should see our storage. You know, I'm like, uh, okay, that's not simplicity. Simplicity is the virtue in which you only buy what you need or you only obtain or possess what you need. And that's usually very hard for people. 
Sometimes that need can also be pertains to decorum. So like if you're a king, what you need is a little bit different than, say, the guy that's just the, the plebe on the street, so to speak. Vices against temperance, gluttony, drunkenness, lust, fornication, mutual acts outside the marriage state. Mutual acts is the theological term for foreplay. Rape, adultery, incest, incontinence, anger is actually, St. Thomas says, against temperance because anger is a complex passion in which there's a perception of some injury to self or others, so there's a sorrow, and then there's a desire to harm the other individual to put an uh, end to the harm. Now, sometimes that, that motion of anger is according to virtue, but a lot of times it's by excess, and so um, cruelty is when a person goes to excess in the seeking of the vindication. Um, pride, curiosity, curiosity is the vice in which we seek useless and profane knowledge or knowledge that is not suited to our state in life. So the people who sit for hours surfing the internet to no real benefit, that's curiosity. There's a whole industry based on curiosity. All the magazines that you see as you go through the counter there when you go through the grocery store, 99% of those are based on the vice of curiosity. As if people really need to know, you know, what Brad Pitt is doing. I mean, who cares? All right. Uh, crudity, this is a lack of etiquette or manners. Um, mo immodesty, okay. Then the uh, theological virtues of faith. Faith is the virtue by which I give assent to what the church teaches. That is, I, I see the truth and I hold it as, as true what the church teaches. Um, the sins against that infidelity. Infidelity is when you reject some aspect um, of the faith in any way. Heresy is when you reject a particular teaching. Apostasy is when you reject the whole. Blasphemy is when you um, say something against God's holy name or something that's holy. Hope is the virtue in which we await the coming of those things. The, um, uh, we await... Um, Beatitude in heaven, and also it's the virtue in which we rely on God to help us get there. Desperation is when you don't think God's going to help you or nothing can help you. And presumption is when you think you can do it on your own. Right. Charity is the virtue in which you love God and love your neighbor for the sake of God. So hatred of God. Sloth is against charity. It can also be against um, temperance. Uh, and it can also be against justice if, and if it mitigates it, but it's against charity here because the person, sloth is the complacency, it's, it's similar to effeminacy, but sloth is when a person doesn't pursue what's arduous because he doesn't want to have to deal with overcoming what is difficult. In other words, he doesn't want to engage what's difficult. Envy, uh, which is different from jealousy. Jealousy is when you have something, but you don't want someone else to have it. Whereas envy is when you don't have something and you want what that other person has to their loss. You don't want them to have it. So that's a sin. That's one of the sins against the, uh, the Holy Ghost, envy. Discord, that's when you're just fighting all the time. Uh, you, just have to, you just don't want to get along with people. Contention is when you're fighting verbally a lot. Schism, so you break off from the church. War, and here we're not talking about just war. There can be legitimate just war, which falls under the virtue of justice. But here we're talking about war that is unjust, and it's a sin against charity because it's contrary to the love of God and love of neighbor. Quarreling, discord is when the person just is always seeking to, you know, kind of not be in congruity with everybody else, whereas quarreling, um, Rick's in Latin, is a little bit different. What quarreling is, is, you know, it's, we just call it feuding where, you know, it's not just in words and that type of thing, but you're doing things and causing difficulty. And then scandal, which of course is doing something which tears away people's faith or um, causes them to not pursue some excellence or some good. Okay. That's what you have to avoid and that's what you have to perfect. This will give you somewhat of an idea of where you're going. You know, if you want to take some time, you can go through this and see, you know, where am I at in all this? You know, am I in the habit of sacrificing? Oh, by the way, mortification falls under forti temperance. I didn't get that in there. Um, mortification is in there. Am I in the habit of sacrificing? You know, and this is a really important point. You know, when people are dating, I always tell people, if you want to know where the, the guy is marriable, here's the list. Does he line up? How does he line up? And that, that's what dating is about. Dating is a process. Courtship is a process in which people manifest whether they have, what the virtues and vices are. 
Which is why people who they see in the first time, we're going to get married. Uh, look it. You don't even know if the guy has the proper virtues or vices. And, you know, this is something that's very important to kind of keep in mind. If they don't have the requisite virtue, avoid them. This is why I always tell, you know, guys, if the woman you're going to marry doesn't have virtue, you're going to pay for it the rest of your life. But if she has virtue, you will have a wonderful life if she has, if she has virtue. And the same thing applies to, to women in relationship to men. If you don't have a virtuous man, he'll make you miserable before it's all over with. On the other hand, if he's a virtuous man, he will make you happy. So, and when we say that uh, marriage is you know, there to help the spouses save their souls, well, this is how they do it, by building virtue, helping each other build virtue. So if you see your spouse doesn't have a particular virtue, then you start offering, you perform the, the sacrifice, you offer something up to God, you sacrifice something to God, you do some type of mortification so that they receive the grace to be inclined towards performing that. So the inclinations that God gives us towards performing the right action is not just from grace, which is important, which is necessary, but he also gives it to us from the infused virtues. And we'll see this in the next class. I'm going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Ghost and then the fruits of the Holy Ghost that the gifts of the Holy Ghost are yet another way that he inclines us to do the right thing. So when we stand before God and we didn't do the right thing, we have no excuse, because he's given us an awful lot. Okay. Any questions? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is quite a chunk. What I would like to do, maybe I'll do this next year, is actually go through these one by one so people have a very clear understanding of what they are. But this will give you an idea of what they are. When I mentioned that book by Rodriguez, he's got all these pretty much laid out in there. They're expensive and they're hard to find, I found out later. That's kind of weird because I, I, I was looking at them some other time and they weren't, weren't that expensive. And, um, it's just called um, The Life of Christian Perfection, I think is the name of it. I did have one question that was obvious to me that I, is the word that doesn't make sense to me. It's number 15, and the rises against justice. Illicit adjuration. I'm not sure what adjuration is there. Oh, uh, adjuration is when you command something in the name of God to do something. Oh, okay. So, you know, um, so illicit adjuration would be when you, you know, you try and, for example, command a demon to do something in the name of God that he shouldn't be doing. You know, like, transport me, you know, in the name of God, transport me to Father Ripperger's class so I can learn something. Okay. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, where there are certain kind of adjurations that are listed. So, for example, what are called binding prayers, you know, in the name of Jesus, you know, spirit of lust, in the name of Jesus, I command you, uh, right, I bind you and I command you to go to the foot of the cross, receive your sentence. Those are completely legitimate. So there's legitimate adjuration and there's illegitimate adjuration. Yeah. Under justice, number nine, swearing, how does that? Yeah, taking an oath, such as in court. That's not swearing in the sense of using that's profane good. languages. That's, um, yeah, that's actually a virtue when you do it according to right order. But it's when you, when you swear and then you, um, if you do it contrary to virtue, it's called perjury. Mm -hmm. So, but it can actually be a virtue? Yes, when you do it when you're supposed to, for example. And St. Thomas says the reason we take, the reason we require, for example, someone to swear on a Bible in a court of law is because we're invoking God's assurance that the testimony is true. Which is why St. Thomas says that if a person commits perjury, he not only violates justice, but he violates the virtue of religion and commits sacrilege in the process. So, which is also another problem, one of, the real, one of the real sins you start to see against the virtue of religion is people taking vows when they're not supposed to. For example, the precept of the prior precept of the church to follow the um, church's laws regarding marriage is being violated. So people will actually violate the virtue of religion. Why? Because St. Thomas says to render a vow is to swear before God. And that means, otherwise it has no meaning. So he says, since that's the nature of it, then what ends up happening is, is anytime people go, even when they go to a justice of the peace and they, take, they do their vows, it's an act of religion. This is why you tell people, that's why you cannot go to the marriages of non-Catholics because 
They're employing a sacrament outside the church which violates injustice, the rights of the magisterium to, to regulate the sacraments which was given to them by Christ. So every time people use the sacraments outside the church, they commit a sin against justice and therefore sacrilege and also against the virtue of religion in relationship to the magisterium. That's why when they talk about how wonderful it is that they have baptism and stuff like this outside the church, no, you're not. As Pius IX said, it's more to their condemnation than to their salvation to make use of these sacraments. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I read a book by Bishop Bubbles, and he said that in heaven, the only uh, theological virtue they have is, is charity. charity. That's Faith right. Faith and hope are no longer needed. Yes. And what about uh, purgatory? Do you need to Faith and hope and purgatory. Uh, yeah, you still have faith and hope and purgatory because of the fact that you're not in that different of a state than you are now, um, except insofar as God has communicated to you. You've had an experience of God through your judgment, and he's communicated to you what your sentence is. But you have hope because you're awaiting the good that God is going to give you when you get to heaven. And you still also have faith because of the fact that um, there are certain things that you still have to accept on faith. You don't have, um, once you see, see, faith is belief in things unseen, basically. It's those things which we don't see. So once you see God face to face, literally the virtue of faith corrupts. And that's not a bad thing. It, it ceases to exist because faith deals with things that are unseen. Well, now you see it. So you don't have that virtue anymore. And any time you perform an action, oh, that's something I forgot to tell you. As soon as you commit mortal sin, you lose all your infused virtue. And the infused virtues can be corrupted through a single act of a single mortal sin. Well, in heaven, seeing God face to face isn't a mortal sin, but the action of seeing him is contrary to the invisible part of faith, and so it corrupts the virtue of faith in the proper and the good sense of that term. So they don't see it. Christ did not have faith. If you ever hear somebody say that Christ was a man of faith, you know he's a heretic. It's that simple. Now, he may not be a formal heretic, but he's a heretic. Why? Because Christ had the beatific vision. He already saw God, so he didn't have faith, nor did he have hope. Why? Because he's already at the beatific vision. Hope is when you haven't gotten there yet, and beatific vision is the goal. So Christ had hope for us, but not for himself, because why? He was already at the end. So people in purgatory have faith and hope and charity, and, but in heaven they don't have faith or hope because um, hope is for the awaiting the thing that you're going to receive when you already receive it, and you already see the thing. But you still have charity, which is the virtue by which you love God, and then the charity becomes perfectly an act in heaven. So, charity is the only virtue that they end up having in heaven. So, uh, charity actually lasts forever? It does, yes. And how much you develop in this life is what you take with you into the next. Which is why that line, you know, from, I can't remember which, I think it was uh, The Gladiator, I think, in the movie, he, he gives that speech and he says, what you do now redounds into eternity. The virtues you develop now go with you into heaven. Because if you remember, I said that perfection, sanctified perfection consists in excellence and grace and the adornment of the soul of all the virtues. But the point is, is that um, your s different people develop different degrees of virtue. And that's what they take with them into the afterlife. And when God looks at your soul, and when other people, when they're in heaven, will be able to look at your soul and they will be able to see in your soul the various virtues that you have. And these virtues, St. Thomas, St. Thomas calls the virtue honestia. Remember where you're always seeking virtue? He says that is called spiritual beauty. And it's called beauty because in beauty there's, um, there's a proportion or symmetry. So you have your faculty and then you have this virtue that adorns it. So there's a certain beauty that is given to it. And that's why, you know, they'll talk about things like the martyrs have a crown in heaven or something like that. And that crown is really just what? It's not that they're sitting in heaven with this physical thing on their head. That's not it at all. What it is, and it's the same thing with Our Lady, the crown of Our Lady actually refers to some perfection. The crown that the martyrs have actually refers to what? Perfection in the virtue of fortitude. So they have, a, they have fortitude to a degree that other people don't have. And God, what it really comes down to is God loves variety. You know, he just likes having, all, I mean, you can tell that by the number of bugs we have. You know, he just loves variety. And so what he does is, is he adores, adorns people's souls with different degrees of virtue because he wants, he, wants a different, he wants variety in heaven. But that sanctified perfection, adornment of the soul of all the virtues and excellence and grace. Well, how do you get the excellence of grace? By building the virtue. But you take these things with you into the next life. But you, you know, 
And that's why you get, people have to build work on it now. You're going to do it now or do it later? Any other questions? Yeah. Do, does uh, sin in general interfere with the, the, your own acquiring the virtue or executing that? Yeah, what it does is, yeah. Sin acts, what it does is it acts contrary to virtue, it develops vice or it increases the vice. So it impedes the exercise of the theological virtues. If it's a mortal sin, it ends up corrupting the theological virtues, or the, the infused virtues, so you lose all of your infused virtues. But if it's just venially sinful, what it does is it develops, it leaves a residual habit, even a single act that receives a little bit of disorder in the faculties. And so as a result, then you have to work on overcoming that, and so that will impede the operations of virtue. So the way you do that is, is you um, perform an action contrary to that, so that you can develop the virtue and, and then get rid of any inclination that you might have towards vice. And if you have a vice, that just means that you haven't developed the virtue. So the sin is the action. Remember when I said action? It's through action that you actually develop the virtue, but it's also through action that you develop vice. So by repeated action, you develop, you develop the acquired virtues and the acquired um, vices. And also, um, you can increase your, or you can also develop a disposition of soul so that you can increase the th infused virtues, but you also can remove the impediments so that the, the, the infused virtues can become more optimal. So, sin is the last thing you want to do. So, when they say, and this is why, remember, I don't know if I said, I think I did, in the first class, people are, when I talked about, um, no, I did it, I think I talked about in relationship to prayer. When people say things like, well, when you're perfect, that's when you stop sinning. Uh-uh. You stop sinning in the beginning. Because remember, the proficient, those are the prayer stage, but the beginners are the people who are still sinning. They're just trying to stay out of sin, but it's the proficient who are getting in the habit of stop. They're not sinning anymore. And that's basically, so when you reach the perfection, you're not sinning anymore, basically. So it's the stop. You have to try and stop sinning immediately. And it can be done. It's called grace. It is possible. So, but what about sin that's not personal? I mean, just sin in the world. Um, if the, we have to suffer purgatory for that's that. Well, actually, the sin that's in the world—if it's not personal, then you don't have to spend any time in purgatory for it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Only if you've been the cause of it. But if you haven't been the cause, then you don't have to spend any time in purgatory for it. But the sin that's in the world can affect us negatively because. It can affect our perception of things. It can make it harder to lead the life of virtue because there's more temptation, that type of thing. Which is one of the reasons why the principal function of the head of state is what, do you think? St. Thomas says that the principal function of those who run the state is to make the citizens happy. Happiness consists in of actions accordant with virtue. Therefore, the principal function of the people who run the state is to enact laws that will make people virtuous. Makes you wonder where we're at, doesn't it? <laughs> so, okay. If you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Supervos et Maniat Semper. Amen. Amen.